Uh, oh my god. You look horrible. Uh, Are you feeling okay? Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey, hey. You look bad. Brains. In fact, Brains. you look dead. Brains. Ah, ah, oh, ah, oh my god. Ah, ah, you bit me. If you're watching this video because you have to make a movie quality prosthetic in less than one day and you have no idea what you're doing, this is the place for you. There is a printout um, in the more information section that's going to tell you how to source your supplies and give you a rough timeline. Please print that out before watching the rest of the video. Casual viewers, enjoy the ride. Now, if you're like me, you don't have a lot of space to work in because you have a fairly significant indoor vegetable garden. Oh, peppers are look ripe. So I'm going to show you how to do this entire project on a single plate. Always start by planning your design. You can use a rough sketch, like in this case I'm thinking maybe a zombie bite on the wrist, so we'll have tooth marks here, and then where the bottom teeth went in we'll have deeper tooth marks and some hanging flesh. Or you can plan a design right on your skin with a washable marker. Either way, plan what you're doing ahead of time, and you've got to think in 3D. Like, these uh, tooth marks will be deep, but they'll be deeper than the gash that surrounds them, that kind of thing. I'll show you on clay. See? Because I made window stickies. You can't They're, make gelatin uh, go into the skin. Really good, you have to build uh, up them. a layer uh, of gelatin. But notice that the red the triceratops is no longer red when the sun hits it for a while. Red food In order to make it look good, away, it should go smoothly so like from the raised purples, lump with the injury uh, if you want your window onto the skin. To maintain color uh, this smooth transition is called a skirt. And we want to get it thin and wide around our lump. I've got my lump in my skirt, but the edge of the skirt isn't very smooth because I'm using air-dry pottery clay, moist pottery clay. So I'm going to take a finger full of water and rub it onto the edge to make the edge very, very smooth. This will create an almost invisible edge to the gelatin, very easy to hide. If you're using oil-based modeling clay, uh, the Never Dry modeling clay or children's modeling clay, it will smooth much more easily so you won't need to use water and by the way you shouldn't use water on oil-based clay it'll just beat up and won't do anything so now I have a very very out of focus there we go uh, mm. so now I have a very very smooth edge to my piece now I'm going to look at my reference and begin creating the wound marks with a tool in this case I have found an old broken pencil in a backpack that seems pretty nasty so I'm gonna start building my tooth marks That looks pretty chompy. But for this part of the wound, where I want a deep gash, like the bottom teeth have ripped it out with tooth marks in it, I have to think about doing multiple layers. First, I'm going to have to remove clay where I want the gash to be removed from. And there are specialty tools for this. Uh, wire loop tools are really great if you go to an art store, but I'm just using my fingers to show that it's easy. So I'm just removing the flesh. And now I'll use my tool again and add some nice rip marks where I want it to look like it's torn through the upper layer of the flesh. And then maybe some muscle below, just a different texture that's been exposed by the tearing. It'll distress the edge a little more. Now I'll add my bottom tooth marks to the bottom side, and I want to make these as deep as I can, so I'll take them all the way down to the plate. I'm going to finish off the wound by touching my skin to the surface of the wound to add a skin texture. This will break up the shiny, fake effect of the gelatin and make it look like skin when it's applied. Let's see if we can get a close up here. So you can see 
the smoothed out clay takes the impression of my skin very nicely. Now take a ball of clay and begin rolling it into a log. Press the log onto your plane to make a dam. The dam should be wider than your piece and much taller than it to allow for enough plaster so that the plaster won't crack when you mess around with it. Notice I'm dipping more water. Um, this air dry clay will need water added to it while it's being formed or else it will crack. That's not a problem you'll have if you're using modeling clay. Make sure to work the clay onto your plate very firmly so that none of the plaster will leak out. This has to act like a real dam. Now it's time to mix up the plaster of Paris. Make more plaster than you'll think you need. Uh, there are usually directions on the container as to how to make it for pouring molds. I like to make mine about the same thickness as like thin drinkable yogurt and make it in a plastic or disposable bowl or cup. It has to be something you can let the plaster harden in because you don't want the extra plaster going down the drain of your sink. It's got to harden in the dish. So we're pouring. You want to pour it and mix it as soon and as quickly as you can or else um, it'll end up hardening. Obviously this stuff will harden really fast because there's a bunch of dry lumps in it. Once you've got it poured, shake it, tap it, uh, zoom in a little. You want to get the air bubbles from below off the surface of your mold and rising. See how the air bubbles are rising up? This way there won't be air bubbles on the surface of your piece. Instead all the air bubbles will be trapped inside the plaster so your piece will be very smooth. Okay, now we let it sit for a while. After a few minutes it'll be soft but stiff. You can take in this case say, a broken pen and write into your mold so that later on you'll be able to tell what it is really easily. So in this case I know it's a zombie bite and I'll date it so if I ever want to find the zombie bite I did in 2012 I can find it really easily. Because it's fun to do this and you can make a lot of molds very quickly so try to keep it organized. Remove the clay dam. After removing the dam, lift off your Oh, well that was useful. Lift off your plaster piece. Um, in this case it came out really nicely. Normally you actually have to peel this off. Uh, this is because I was using wet clay with wet plaster, so the wet clay has remained very sticky and adhered to the plate. I don't have to peel it out of the mold because it's stuck better to the plate than it did to the still wet mold. After peeling away the excess clay, if it's water-based clay, rinse away the residue with water. If it's an oil-based clay, scrape away whatever residue you can and mop it up like a napkin. If it's a wax-based clay, you can burn out their last with a lighter. The clay from the mold can be balled back up, peeled or scraped off your plate, and reused again later by being sealed in a plastic bag. After everything else is dried, it's time to dispose of the dried out plaster, which you did not dump down the sink because that would permanently clog your pipes. By using either a disposable cup or a flexible plastic bowl, it's possible to simply crush and get rid of all the plaster. First I'm going to show you how to mix, then I'm going to show you the recipes you can mix together and what the results are. So let's look at the mixing process first. I'm measuring in a bottle cap just to show you that you can use anything to measure the parts. Sorbitol, which is 70% sorbitol. You cannot use um, the fake maple syrup with sorbitol. It's only like what percent, Ben? 18. Yeah, it's only 18%. You want 70. Now notice, I am sprinkling the gelatin and stirring it. The worst thing you can do is start with the gelatin. You'll end up with a big rock hard lump that no amount of microwaving will soften. So sprinkle and stir. Notice when I stir, I stir smoothly. I'm not adding bubbles. If you do not add bubbles during this process, you'll get a very clear, beautiful gelatin. I'll show you that now. This is a gelatin sample I've had for a few months. Uh, and you can see without adding bubbles, it's very clear. You can read through it. See, 
I made window stickies. They're uh, clear enough so that they look really good, and ah, I love them. Uh, but notice that the red Triceratops is no longer red when the sun hits it for a while. Red food coloring just goes away really fast. So use like greens or blues or purples uh, if you want your window stickies to maintain color for a while. To avoid adding more bubbles, you want to make sure you don't boil it. But in case you do boil it, make sure you're mixing in a tall microwave safe container. If this stuff starts boiling and it does very easily, it's going to like all the way out there. Um, so we are now in my handy dandy nasty craft microwave and we're going to start heating it for about 30 seconds at a time. Ready, steady, go. Between heating, stir the gelatin gently, then heat again. You're going to want to do this till you can see that the gelatin granules have completely dissolved into the liquid. Alright, let's see how it turned out after five cookings. You know it's cooked enough when it gets to this semi-transparent, so you can see the spoon moving behind it, the semi-transparent consistency. That's when the gelatin's dissolved. It's really, really syrupy. And this is when it's dangerous because if you spill it on you, you can't really scrape it off. It just sticks and burns you, so be really careful. Remember the spoon? Yeah, hot. Now, but I want to show you what happens if you let it boil, just so you know what to watch out for. Ready? We get this foaming, and it very quickly is going to explode out and fill the whole microwave. Oh, Jesus. Here is the mold being sprayed with Pam. Ooh, buttery flavor. Delicious. Just want to spread the oil over it. Excess oil that builds up in cracks. Blot it out with a paper towel, or spray more lightly next time. In my case, I like to get the mold to absorb a lot of oil and just get rid of the excess manually. All right, having unbent the spoon, I'm now going to spread it around to make a nice skirt. I want a very thin edge of the gelatin to help it blend in with skin. So let's see what this is like when we peel it off. Yeah, this is peeling it off with a release. A little bit of stick, but it comes right off. Here I've cast three different wounds from the same mold using different formulas. So if you don't want to buy the sorbitol online, or you can't get access to a sorbitol syrup for diabetic people, you can instead try making it out of gelatin and glycerin only, or just gelatin. Let's look at the properties of each of these different uh, mixtures. When we have gelatin and glycerin only with no sorbitol, no water, we get a firm, see how the pen's barely sinking, appliance, but the appliance is more prone to tearing uh, than the right mixture I showed you. See that? Tears really easy. When we've got the gelatin, the sorbitol, and the glycerin, it's very, very firm. You can see it's um, resisting puncture pretty well. It's also pretty tear resistant. So if I peel it up and I apply pressure at the same thin part, you can see I'm really struggling and it's not ripping. When we look at plain gelatin, which is three parts gelatin, no sorbitol, no glycerin, and four parts water instead, it's very, very thin. This is great for real thin stuff, like flaky skin bits and stuff. Uh, but when I turn it over and apply pressure to the same spot, very easy to tear. So the addition of the sorbitol and the glycerin increases tear strength and you know ability to not be punctured, but you can close with just the glycerin. Something else I want to show you is this is older than this and this. I made this one and this one today. When we compare them, I think it's hard to see on camera, but this is thicker. This has absorbed the moisture in the air because the sorbitol is sucking in the water vapor and making it poofy. It's hygroscopic. And because of that, 
it's now bigger and thicker. So that means tomorrow this will stay poofy with whatever the local humidity is, and then this will start shriveling. That can be a good thing or a bad thing. If you're in a desert, this is going to be nothing. It's going to be a mummy. You're in the desert, this is going to stay nice and big. You're where I am in like 100% humidity and constantly cloudy. This is going to poof up and grow in size. You do something in the rain, it's going to swell. Stop to watch a movie between uh, segments and check it out. One hour after making this, see that curling edge? As the surface dries from air movement, it contracts, peeling up the edges. So you can imagine that in a day, this is going to be like totally shriveled. Now, how it dries would be different if it's on skin, because you got sweat coming into it and stuff like that, but not a real stable idea. Meanwhile, our glycerin friend, still nice and smooth, hasn't really changed. Okay, on to makeup. So here I've made one of the zombie bites up with makeup. You'll see me applying it to Ben, but I wanted you to be able to see it still. The colors don't come out too well on my cheapo camera, but you can see I've got a little bit of metallic shine in the muscle tissue, darkened up inside the holes to make them appear deeper than they are, and then liberally applied some gel blood and really let that sucker run. Now, isn't that lovely? So to attach this to this, <laughs> We need something like this. This is Spirit Gum and Spirit Gum Remover. They are a sticky thing sold with makeup kits at Halloween stores, theater stores, and they typically will come with prosthetic kits. However, I prefer something a little more hardcore. This is New Hope Medical Adhesive. It's used to attach colostomy bags to folks' stomas when they've had to have like a part of their colon removed. So it's really good at sticking. Begin by flipping over your prosthetic or appliance to the back getting the excess glue off your brush, or in this case the dauber. You only need a thin layer, so you don't have to make it really thick. This isn't white glue. You want the thinnest layer you can get. Then apply it to the back of the prosthetic. Get a nice thin layer, and especially the edges. Make sure you get those edges, and let it dry. As it gets tacky, we're also going to apply it, the glue, to where we're putting the appliance or adhesives. Again, a nice thin layer. And when both of those are really sticky, we'll put both glue sides together and get a nice firm hold. So let's get give that like a minute to dry. And we know it's ready to stick when that happens. How's it feel? Yeah. So to apply the prosthetic, I'm just going to start with an edge, lay it on gently, and then work it in and work the edges down real smooth as long as you don't get the edges stuck right from the get-go, you can work them in and make a really almost invisible seam. So I'm using cheap-ass makeup um, for this. Not theater makeup, but actual like face makeup. In this case, this cover girl matches Ben's skin tone pretty well. So I'm just going to powder it on. And the powdering will make the glue that's exposed on his skin less sticky. I prefer to use the powder to liquid foundation because the powder allows the translucency, the partial transparency of the gelatin to shine through, just like real skin. So we'll all apply several layers of this off camera, then blend it with the brush. So you can see here where I've got really great glue adhesion, it's almost an invisible line. But then here, where the beard hairs have made the glue not stick as well, we have a much more noticeable seam. And that's a lesson on where you attach it. And also, bend your neck a little bit. See how that bending makes it move? As Ben's been reading, he's been working the seam. So this will work for one shot, but this would be a really bad place to stick the prosthetic for a whole night. All right, so on to the wound. So as a note, you can see the outlines and the different colors of this really great because I'm using a harsh white light. This is intentional so you can see the whole process. If I used a natural light with more pink in it, this would be a lot more invisible, but I want you to see the process on camera. So if it looks a little fake, that's intentional. So 
So I'm well, going to use you know, face makeup, but I'm also going to use some Halloween makeup. You can use one or both or a combination, just options are open. So let's start coloring the inside of the wound with uh, some lipstick. Trade me. Lipstick, please. Oh, you dropped it. So the lipstick is one with some mica in it because muscle tissue is shiny. It's got this connecting tissue within it that gives it this glisten. So I like using something that's got a little glisten in it to get going. I put it on heavy and I can work it with a brush. Because this is supposed to be a fresh wound, we're not going to have a lot of swelling or pink around it, just where the rip is. Um, if this was a wound that was supposed to be a couple minutes old, we'd have a whole lot of swelling and redness around it. So I'm going to blend that with a stiff paintbrush that I have trimmed short for the purpose of blending. And after blending it, I am going to bring in some black pigment uh, from the costume makeup to really make the holes look dark. So now I've loaded my brush with some black cream makeup. I'm just going to go in here, little dot in the center of the darkest part of each tooth hole on the bottom and the top. It's especially important on the bottom because the appliance isn't very thick, so we've got to create the illusion of depth near the bottom. I'm just going to really blend that in so that it doesn't look like we've got black holes. It looks like we've got teeth rips. And so now I can start adding some gore. I'm going to come back in with bright red cream makeup and fake blood. Fake blood for the wound, I'm using stuff I bought cheap at the end of last Halloween, which means that this stuff is a solid lump. The gel blood does not have an infinite shelf life. So um, this does though. This won't dry because it's not made with gelatin. I don't think it is. Nope. And so it's going to stay moist no matter how long I have it in my shelf. So I'm going to have this dripping from the tooth wounds, from the neck hole, wherever it should be bleeding profusely. I'm not going to do everything with total detail because I don't want to hide the makeup job I've done. I just want to indicate that it's a fresh wound just started bleeding. Okay. You can rewind to the beginning of the video if you want to see this again. Here's an example of something else you can use the gelatin for that also shows its longevity. Uh, this is over a year old. It's a mold for bronze pouring. And I molded a twig, then poured wax into the gelatin, and pulled out the wax to cast into bronze. You can see here, here's where the wax line was, and look, a year later, it's still the same height. And so, probably partially due to the high humidity where I live, which on average is about 65 to 70%, but also because of the recipe, this mold has stayed the same size without shrinking for a year, and you can still see it's nice and flexible, and I could keep casting with it. Here I've pulled the mold out of the measuring cup I poured it into, and with the bubbles from the top turned, you can see the translucency of the gelatin and the shape which I cast. Because the gelatin is translucent, you can treat it a lot like um, translucent silicone, you know, where you can go and cut your piece free very accurately out of a solid block without destroying the mold. Um, I mean, you, you've got to be a little bit careful. The wax can't be super molten. It had to be just this side of melted, but it worked really great, and I got several accurate reproductions from this single piece of gelatin. And if I want to, I can melt this down and reuse it. Again, over a year old, great condition.